All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm joined by our first Deputy Commissioner Barb Lark and Deputy Commissioner Al Wright. Uh, so earlier today, uh, about noon, we sent out body camera video regarding the March 29th uh, police chase and officer-involved shooting. I uh, hope everyone had an opportunity to review that. Uh, the things that have changed uh, in the last couple of days is that the uh, District Attorney, John Flynn, had a press conference the other day where he made a determination of clearing the officers involved in discharging their weapons of any criminal culpability. And with that, that allows us the opportunity now to uh, expand and, and uh, complete our internal investigation, which is ongoing. Uh, so with that, we'll take questions. I got to say, I, again, I'm not a police officer. I want to stress that we've never had any training like you guys do. I've only been in a car once with a siren on, boy, your adrenaline jumps. So I'll say that as a preface. But looking at that tape do you feel that your officers placed themselves or other officers in danger as a result of their actions during this chase you know i, I think we have to look at the the origin of this and we have to look at who is responsible for this situation we have an individual that is a, a convicted violent felon because of a prior gun conviction with an extended magazine uh, in this scenario he opened fire on police officers out in an urban setting, out on the public, in the public streets. Uh, again, having another handgun that he is not allowed to possess uh, that also had an extended 30 round magazine. Um, you know, these scenarios don't take place on a range. They don't take place in a setting with, you know, with no issues in a backdrop. Um, and on multiple occasions uh, throughout the length of this uh, half an hour pursuit, he continued to discharge his weapon. That is in the uh, allegation paperwork. So that's what he's been indicted on. Um, and officers had a, a duty and an obligation to do their best to, to end that. Uh, we are reviewing all of the discharges of the, uh, of the weapons. Every officer that fired a round is obviously responsible for where that round goes. Uh, that also comes back to training. Uh, we're gonna use this uh, in addition as, a, as a, an additional teaching moment, if you will, uh, we are going to look at where we need to improve upon training, change training, retrain people that have been trained on some of these already. Uh, we have a simulator that we are putting together a new form of uh, more reality-based training where they can engage in these uh, scenario-based um, areas to help improve upon that. You know, the unfortunate thing to answer your question is that we don't get to pick and choose where these things happen. Thank God nobody in the public was hit by a stray round, uh, either by police or by the, the defendants in this case. Um, so it's, it's, uh, this is a scenario that was not in the norm. This is something that you just don't see with any, not even with any regularity. You almost never see a situation like this. Could you talk about the officer that uh, observed the passenger jump out of the vehicle, what, what did they do? What was that interaction? Where did the passenger go? Yeah, that fell out. So uh, a passenger in the vehicle uh, exited the vehicle, uh, by my knowledge of her own doing, uh, and a police car picked up that passenger, uh, got her at some point in the back of their police car, and then they continued on in the pursuit. So that's something that we are looking at as part of our internal review as well. And that's obviously not a normal situation that they would do? No, in, in that case, uh, that should have stopped right there. That, that should not have continued on that. And again, that's part of the internal probe that we're looking at, and that will be addressed through that, uh, through that process. Yeah, could you talk about the beginning of the chase, how it started? Because I know you have a strict policy about when you're allowed to chase and when you're not. And what it sounds like you guys were talking We are, and as you can see by the body camera video that we released, uh, that initial stop was based on the tinted windows of the vehicle. A plate check then showed that the uh, plate was not valid. Uh, the officers approached. Uh, they obtained the identification from the driver. Um, it was determined that the driver's license was also not valid. Uh, the interaction between the officer and the, uh, and the operator was what I would call very cordial, very professional, very relaxed. Um, the officers, because of the uh, infractions with the vehicle and the driver, were going to properly have the vehicle towed. Uh, 
Um, the operator of that vehicle explained to the officer that he could not walk because of a prior shooting injury. Uh, the officer uh, was working out a way to uh, assist that individual out of the car. At that point, he fled, as you can see on the video. Um, based on that information, uh, that is not within our pursuit policy, and the pursuit at that point should not have been engaged. We see between roughly a minute and a half and two minutes into that pursuit uh, where the woman exited the vehicle and then seconds later uh, the first shot was fired by the defendant in this case. That changed the game at that point and that made the pursuit within policy. So. But at one point, Commissioner, uh, at about 8.42 in the released video, we hear dispatch say no cut the pursuit, cut the pursuit in which the officer then says, uh, who is driving, he seems frustrated and he says, no, no, and continue. Did you see that moment? I did, and uh, when a, uh, a command officer called for that pursuit to be terminated, at that point, we believed that we had multiple officers shot, firearms uh, was still being discharged. A higher ranking officer with my endorsement continued the pursuit. The speeds were not uh, high from what we have seen, but there is a, um, uh, there definitely is a danger to the public with him freely shooting throughout this. Uh, you know, and as I said, you operate on the information you have at the time. We believe that we had multiple officers shot. There certainly, you know, was, uh, you know, had the one shot on Bailey, uh, then the other, uh, you know, belief of a second officer shot uh, throughout that point. So uh, at that point, uh, the pursuit was, was uh, rightfully allowed to continue. Those, those situations, and I'll say this again, this is not a normal situation. Those situations are, are very hectic. They're very, um, uh, just hectic is the word I'm gonna use, but uh, so that, to answer your question. Uh, the officer shooting out the window at one point they passed the McDonald's, she is shooting, uh, it seems to be a woman officer out the window. Is that part of protocol too? Because like you said, I mean, it's very hard to train for this. Was she the right to do that? So that's what our internal probe is going to look at. What you have here in this scenario is, was the use of deadly physical force justified? In this case, it was. Uh, the district attorney has cleared all officers that discharge their weapons um, of any criminal culpability. We now have to look in our policies and procedures. Now, our use of force policy prohibits shooting at or from a motor vehicle unless deadly physical force is being used against you by means other than the vehicle. So we have to look and see what those officers that were discharging their weapons, uh, what did they face at that time? Were they under fire? There's, you know, that's why I'm not gonna make any, um, uh, any opinions right now with the second. We have not had an opportunity to conduct interviews with the officers. Uh, the officers are all cooperating. They were cooperating, but they are also afforded uh, rights when it comes to uh, internal probes. When there was a criminal investigation still pending, I can certainly mandate a statement from an officer. However, if it was determined in another hypothetical setting, if it was determined that an officer was going to face criminal charges, a statement that I can mandate internally then could not be used in a court of law. So we have to be very careful when you get the attorneys involved and what rights the officers have on when we can question. The officers, all the officers involved uh, provided a, uh, a brief statement that did not allow us the opportunity to question them at the time. We now have those statements scheduled and those statements will be completed within two weeks. So the moment that the DA uh, cleared all officers of any criminal culpability, we immediately scheduled those statements to take place. Even though he is not a police officer, you did hear the comments of the district attorney questioning common sense here during this chase with the behavior of officers. What is your reaction to that? Uh, you know, the, the, the district attorney had a different investigation than I have. The district attorney is looking at the criminal side of the matters. I am now gonna, and, and that has been completed and with the indictment and the arraignment. I'm gonna wait until we have completed our interviews and complete our investigation, and yes, this has been long and ongoing, but I explained why we have not been able to interview the officers. So I'm going to complete that investigation uh, as soon as those interviews are done. And as I said, they should be done. Uh, they're all scheduled within the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's multiple officers that have to be interviewed. That's going to take some time. 
Uh, and then I'll have a file review with our Internal Affairs Command staff and Internal Affairs investigators, and we will go through each and every one of those. Is that Monday morning order package by the district attorney? Oh, I'm not going to address uh, what, uh, what the district attorney said. Like I said, he, um, he had his uh, criminal probe, and I'm going to look at my internal probes. I I'm not going to get in the back and forth about that at all. What are the potential results of that investigation? I'm sorry, what are the... What, what could it go from? If it was deemed that there were policy and procedure violations, uh, then our disciplinary um, process is outlined. Uh, the potential of uh, departmental charges could be weighed, and then uh, based on what those are, you know, there's a myriad of, of different things that uh, could be a part of that if anybody is charged with any departmental violations. That could range, if they're found guilty of any departmental violations, that could range from training, you know, right up on through termination. That's what the wide gamut of our disciplinary process holds. Do you have video of when Kente Bell was allegedly shooting? Uh, not. A, I don't have any on body camera. We don't. If we if we had that, we would have released that. Um, we have not released any surveillance video, so I, I don't have the answer to that question right now. Another question about the passenger uh, that was picked up. Were they in a To the best of my information, they were not in a, in a lead position, and, and again, to the best of my knowledge, uh, their vehicle did not sustain any um, any uh, rounds fired from through their vehicle. vehicle. Were rounds being fired from that vehicle? No, no rounds were fired from that vehicle either. You mentioned that this video could potentially be used for training down the line. What specifics of uh, what specific aspects of training could this potentially provide some insight into future current officers? I, I think what we have to look at is, uh, you know, you look at different scenarios around the country, we learn from each other, good or bad or indifferent, uh, but we also have a, uh, a virtual system, uh, simulator system, uh, where we can input even more scenarios than we already have in them. Um, we are, as I said, we're in the process of uh, putting that additional training in place where we start bringing officers in again to get them through that system. You know, it, it's, we just, we have to learn from what we do, good, bad or indifferent. Can you just clarify one last thing here? The number of officers that were hit, uh, how they were hit, and also we see video showing bullet holes in the windshield of the police car during the one. Uh, can, can, where did that come from? Was it the officer shooting out the windshield? Or what? So uh, the defendant in this case was indicted on actually shooting one officer. That was, that was uh, proven through the grand jury process for an indictment. Now, obviously, they'll have to go through the trial process to, to prove that, um, to get a conviction on that case. Um, the, another officer, it's, uh, it, it appears that it was friendly fire. I don't know that we're ever, I, I'll say that we are probably never going to determine where that round came from, wherever it came from, whether it was on the defender, whether it was friendly fire, we just there's no there's no way to forensically uh, determine where that round came from. Obviously, then the district attorney could not present that as evidence uh, based on his legal findings. There, why an indictment was not uh, sought for that particular matter. The other officer, um, it's uh, most probable that it was an ejected shell casing uh, that would have struck his vest again in a very chaotic situation. That. Um, you know, at that time, led him to believe that, that he, in fact, was struck by something. And then the bullet holes in the windshield? Yeah, there were uh, a couple instances you see in the video where, uh, you know, the operators of those vehicles discharge their weapons through the windshield over their steering wheels. All right, is that it? And there were 16 officers who fired shots? We have 16 officers that discharged their weapon throughout this. At the end of the video, you'll see we listed all 16 officers. Uh, we released... I believe it's nine videos of officers that discharge their weapons, if I, if I have that correct, been going through a lot of this video. Um, and we also list why, uh, next to each officer's name, why there was no video. We had a couple of detectives that were not issued body cameras. They're, you know, by nature of their assignment, they don't have body cameras issued to them. Uh, we had a net team officer that did not have a body camera issued. Uh, we have uh, since, uh, we had to purchase more body cameras and, and they've been issued. Uh, we had a couple of officers whose body cameras uh, were broken, malfunctioned. They had the proper documentation in. Uh, they have since been replaced, and they have new cameras. 
and we have uh, one officer, maybe two, we have two officers uh, whose body cameras came on after they discharged the weapons, and that will also be a, a part of the internal investigation. One more, if we have one more. Um, at the end of the vehicle, or end of the chase when the vehicle came to a stop, there was like a segment of, I think like 11 seconds where there was just continuous gunfire, and then there was like a pause, and then there was It's tough to see in the body camera that we release, but you know we have the opportunity to slow it down and, and look at it in this setting. But um, you know the officers in their setting and what they see at that time. There was a time where you see the defendant's hand come up after he crashed into that sign and his car was disabled. You see his his hand come up above the level of the window, um, and it should be noted that the gun was recovered from his lap at that point. So. Um, you've got an individual that at numerous locations continuously fired his weapon. Uh, you know, we had, at that time, we, we had multiple officers that were shot. And as I can see in the video, his hand comes up. So I'm not going to say what the officers saw from their close live advantage point or van vantage point. Uh, I'm going to say what I saw on the video. Uh, but the officers, and again, has been deemed uh, that they were within the law as far as the use of deadly physical force. I think what you also see in the video is there was that you know short amount of final uh, gun bursts that were going off and you also had a, an officer and a lieutenant yelling cease fire and, and taking that scene under control. What we also have is the SWAT team responded. They were at a, a different community event. They were out for another reason, not an enforcement action. Uh, I believe it was on Fillmore Avenue where they were, so they responded very quickly. And we have multiple New York State certified EMT members on the SWAT team that almost immediately began rendering aid. St uh, you know, started getting him, um, you know, getting his shirt cut off of him. They have quick clots. They have more uh, advanced life-saving equipment, first aid equipment than our police officers have, and they have the New York State EMT certification to do that. So they were um, uh, rendering first aid on this individual. As, as soon as they possibly could. We all good. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate right. it. Thank, Thank you. Can we talk about the bicycle? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, we had another fatal accident involving the bicycle last night. I think we've got terrible on the South Park. There have been another, a couple of very serious ones. Can you talk about what's going on with that? Is there any kind of enforcement or? Well, I mean, I, I think in last night's case, let's talk about that one for what I can talk about at this point. Uh, it was a hit and run, uh, a vehicle, a, a, a truck struck a person on a bicycle uh, and fled the scene. The individual died at the scene. Uh, that vehicle uh, continued on, as I said, uh, was spotted in West Seneca. The West Seneca Police Department engaged in a, a, a pursuit. I don't know how long that was. I don't have all the particulars of that, but engaged in a pursuit with this vehicle that matched the description of the vehicle from our hit and run. They were able to take that, uh, stop that vehicle and get that individual into, into custody. The uh, individual uh, was charged with driving while intoxicated. I don't know what other charges that person faced. You'll have to get that from West Seneca Police. Our accident investigators were out in West Seneca. Um, we are working very closely with them. They with us as well as the district attorney's office on working on the uh, fatal hit and run case from, from the city of Buffalo. But no charges in the city of Buffalo, no, no charges. That yes, investigation is continuing. Yes. One other off topic, real quick. You saw the sheriff's office yesterday. This new behavioral uh, assessment team. Will any of your officers be assigned to that? And I have a two partner here. Also today, the state of New York coming out saying that they want to analyze social media policies. Anybody applying for a gun permit, you expect some of your officers could be assigned to do that. Uh, so I, I think it's great what Sheriff Garcia was able to accomplish with the bipartisan support of the county legislature. It's, it's vastly needed. Um, we have our behavioral health team that's headed by Captain Bayer. They are a part of a countywide um, assessment, threat assessment team. Um, we've been doing uh, some threat assessments on identified individuals with a mental health uh, uh, history. We also, as of Monday, will have our first behavioral health team threat assessment red flag detective we announced that uh, about a month ago uh, where we announced that position by union contract we have to post a position um, the union allowed us to to do a short posting uh, 
uh, so we didn't have to wait a full 30 days. They were in agreement with us and we were able to do a, a, a shorter time frame posting. Uh, we now have a detective that will be in that position starting Monday. Um, you know, uh, we are going to use our detective who will be trained in threat assessments, uh, crisis intervention, uh, every last bit of training that the behavioral health team gets, this detective will also get, but the detective will also be tasked with uh, red flag, um, uh, red flag notifications, uh, orders, the emergency orders, uh, where we feel that we need to get into court to remove weapons from a person who has been identified as a threat to themselves or others. Uh, going along with the Sheriff's Department, we all work very well in the sandbox together, all of us do, and we have for quite some time. This is going to be another tool where uh, we'll have more detectives, more personnel, all rowing in the same direction, doing the same work. So I think it's a great thing that uh, they were able to get on the county level as well. Right. Just to clarify, with the office, would any of your officers work at social media? That's we do. Cool. We've been doing that. We, uh, you know, not on the pistol permit side, obviously that's you know, that's a difference uh, that we'll have to come in on background checks for those applying for pistol permits. Uh, but we examine the, the social media as a regular course of business, both on the uh, gang and group violence, uh, on any, uh, you know, potential uh, racially motivated extremist uh, hate uh, crimes or, uh, you know, any, anything of that nature. We've been doing that for years. Um, I can go back to uh, a large-scale event probably five years ago we had an individual on social media that was making threats to an event um, I don't want to specifically name the event uh, but we had uh, intelligence unit detectives back then uh, probably five years ago that immediately jumped on that we we have been doing this obviously we need to do more and do it uh, better We are, and we have uh, expanded our, our presence at large-scale events, uh, something that's new to the uh, festival here, and you're going to start to see going forward at other festivals, is uh, the presence of SWAT team members. Uh, we have drones, so we will be able to monitor those high-level positions, uh, and we will have SWAT members uh, around, you know, and I, it's, it's a sad state of affairs that we have to put such um, you know, heavily armed, highly trained personnel, uh, but I think it is a, a comfort factor to people that are going out. We've been doing that for years uh, at the marathon. Uh, we've done it at the Turkey Trot. Uh, when, when the Boston bombing occurred, that, you know, put those into a different frame. And uh, normally we like to have our SWAT members kind of out of sight, not out of mind, have them watching, monitoring, in a position to move in if necessary. We have on some occasions, and we will on this occasion, we will have our members uh, kind of in and out of the crowd, kind of on, uh, you know, to be visible, and we will be closely monitoring. So it's, again, it's a sad state of affairs, but this is what we've come to. Uh, you know, people should not stay home. They got, you have to live your life. But it's, uh, you know, we're charged with the responsibility of making sure that people uh, can feel a little bit safer when they go out, and we're going to do that. Thank you, everyone. Have All a right. great week. Thank you. Thank you.